me, and I'd echo what Dr. Meyer said, that it's very impressive what's been achieved over a short period of time. And I would also emphasize, as did Dr. Meyer, that you're not going to find any literature on the orthopedic manifestations. So one has to be very general in one's statements and try to express the different clinical scenarios that we treat in an open-ended manner. So I know we heard a lot yesterday about the basic science, the genetics and all this, and orthopedic surgeons typically fall asleep pretty quickly during all this because our software approaches problems in a different manner. So we recognize that even within the genetics of it, that it's heterogeneous. And we also recognize that there are certain clinical findings which you all know about, which I won't spend too much time on, but mainly weakness, hypotonia, proximal muscles more than distal muscles and so on. So what do you do from the orthopedic perspective? Well, I think we tend to look at phenotype more than genotype. And I think we really look at an individual. We don't look at, you know, my strategy is usually to go in and deliberately not know anything about the neuromuscular patients and talk to the child and the family and then read the chart later to find out about these specifics. Because what I really want to know is who is this person, what do they want to achieve with regard to their function, what's their clinical trajectory been, because ultimately it's all about establishing reasonable functional goals. So literature, forget about it. You're not going to find much literature. What I'll draw upon is experiences of everything from polio to cerebral palsy and in between to make any generalizations. But I think it is key that you want to have a multidisciplinary setting so that everyone has some input into the orthopedic management, that every patient is unique, and that really you guys are involved in the decision making. We should be able to communicate with you and say, well, this is our assessment of the physical findings. Um, this is what technical solutions are available to try and address these physical findings. But the biggest issue is, what's the goal? So if you see there, an impairment is a problem in a body function and structure. So in orthopedic clinic, I can examine 20 patients and write down lists of all the different findings. Some are relevant, some are irrelevant, some are linked to function, some are just something we see. So how do you put it all together? And that's where I think the shared decision making comes in because we work with children and families to try and achieve goals which we define, which we determine as a group. And so within this paradigm, what's most important is trying to promote participation and promote activities, be they activities of daily living, sport, sitting, standing, whatever it is that is reasonable for that patient becomes the goal and then technical solutions are offered to try and reach that functional goal. And I think that's the way you have to, you know, perceive the orthopedic elements of all this. So what do we want to talk about? I think the biggest issues that you might be concerned with would be the development and treatment of contractures because they're ubiquitous. And hip dysplasia is another problem that's common in neuromuscular diseases, and the solutions and approaches differ, and we'll talk a little bit about that. These are more issues of function, whereas the scoliosis and the spinal deformity, I think, is an issue of general physiology and health. So I think those things have to be separated in their discussion. So how about contractures? Well, Contracture essentially means that you don't have full range of motion at a joint. As I had mentioned previously, it may be relevant or it may be irrelevant. If you sit 100% of the time and your knee doesn't quite straighten all the way, you might not find that to be an issue. And furthermore, attempts to keep your knee straight may be very difficult if you're not standing or walking all the time. So then maybe you know, it, that might not be a worthy clinical goal of keeping the knee straight. Muscle imbalance, not typically in this scenario. Positional influences, I think, are enormous. If you want to know the ultimate, that would be that of polio, which is a different disease, different trajectory, different everything. But the point is that in the face, in that patient population, in the face of a sudden episode of muscle weakness, where you suddenly got weakness and imbalance, that while that's recovering, if you don't maintain your range of motion, you will lose it simply because of the effects of gravity and positioning. So the same can be said for a growing child with weakness 
or maybe who perhaps uh, isn't taking the same number of steps or the same amount of time upright, that positional influences lead to development of contractures. Contracture can be a short muscle, classic example being like in cerebral palsy or in spastic disease, um, but it can happen in many different scenarios. Or in um, muscular dystrophy, that category where muscles are replaced with connective tissue. It's another scenario. Same physical findings, different reason for it. And then contractures also long-standing can involve the joint capsule. So if the joint stuck, you wouldn't want to lengthen the muscle and expect to straighten out the joint because the problem's in the joint as well as the muscle. So as a surgeon, being able to recognize exactly where the problem is helps to outline a strategy. They're typically flexion contractures, you know that. So how about, why do I show this picture? Well, these are all polio patients, right? All of them have bad flexion contractures of their lower extremities, right? They all haven't been treated, they've laid like that, and so let's just say for the purpose of argument that they're all rigid. Why is it that, let's say I drop down into India or somewhere who's having a polio camp and I see 200 kids and I get to figure out which 20 am I gonna operate on? How am I gonna figure that out? They all look the same, right? The reason why I bring this up is because we should look as a group with the family and our all neuromuscular providers to try and establish a trajectory for function. So two of these patients here, this patient and this patient, I would, and one of them I did, straighten the lower extremities. Why? Because they have good trunk, good upper extremities. They're crawling, they're able to walk on their knees. So their impediment to getting upright mobility is simply the orthopedic contractures. Whereas this patient who can't lift his rear end off the seat and this patient who's got severe trunk and upper extremity involvement, those patients, if I straighten out their leg, they're not going to get a functional improvement. So I think that's the point. Examining the whole and establishing a functional goal prior to doing anything in the orthopedic arena. So then, once we establish a goal with a family for a particular thing for a patient, then of course it becomes a, a variety of technical solutions that we might offer to be able to achieve that goal. And that's where we're at. So we've got proactive strategies to prevent, and obviously that's not surgery. Surgery is more a reactive thing to restore and maintain range of motion. So simple things like maintaining certain uh, periods within selected positions, for example, prone lying to prevent hip flexion contractures. Physical therapy, of course. But what makes more sense to me, I think back to experiences like in, in Nepal, for example, there's no physical therapist. There's no health infrastructure. The kids come from villages. They have some of the same problems. So what do you do? Well, typically they live in extended family uh, houses and the, and the parents may be out in the fields and the grandparents become the therapists. So in essence, physical therapy becomes an activity of daily living with the goal of like promoting a healthy lifestyle. It's not sustainable to have physical therapists over there, so it all involves training the family and the parents and the grandparents and the children to do stuff that's fun that actually achieves the double goal the goal of maintaining the range of motion, right? So if you just say, well, do these exercises three times a day, well, who wants to do exercises three times a day? You gotta figure out a way to make it fun or make it usable. Now, I'm not to say that I have all the answers, but there are strange resources, sort of, uh, including like this one book called Disabled Village Children from Hesperian Foundation that have all sorts of nice drawings of things that kids in the villages do to maintain their range of motion and stuff. So I don't want to spend too much time babbling. But anyway, orthotic devices you're all familiar with. Conceptually, we just try to maintain the position of a joint. Static splint is like an ankle foot orthosis, but dynamic splinting is helpful to try and prevent the development of contractures. So that's a splint which, for example, you can sleep with at night around the knee that delivers some stresses and forces to not only keep the muscle in a position, but actually to try and gain something. And then wear schedule, that's, that's a, a thing between the family and, and the care team. So how about the reactive strategy for contractures? Well, it's pretty straightforward, right? You can have tight muscles and tight joints. 
So we typically do lengthening of muscles. If the muscle works, we make it longer. In polio, if the muscle doesn't work, you just cut it. That's the principle. And, you know, naturally, lengthening a muscle will weaken it, so one has to be judicious. So often we'll just lengthen the fascial envelope of the muscle and not cut the muscle. For example, get 50% of a contracture with surgery and rely on therapy, splinting, and or casting to get the other 50%, so as not to weaken the muscle. So each approach for each patient. Osteotomy is something where a bone is realigned to restore range of motion at a joint. It steals movement. It changes the arc of movement to get the joint straight. And then the post-op concerns, you all know, we want to be able to do strategies which get patients up as soon as possible with neuromuscular disease. There's always a risk of losing function. And then there's always a risk of things getting back to where they were. So we need a maintenance program, be it therapy and splinting and so on to, to keep the gains that were obtained by some type of intervention. So here's a patient with polio, tend to get hip flexion contracts. The reason why I keep saying this polio thing is that a lot of what I see in myopathies and in certain neuropathies uh, sort of mimic the type of contractures that I see here. You can see the tight band there going all the way around the knee. It's a contracture of the hip and the knee. And it's... Uh, can be treated by release there. But anyway, so the knee flexion contracture seems to be the most disabling of all these contractures. Um, the hip contracture, which I just showed you, is amenable to a relatively simple surgery that's extra articular, doesn't involve the joint, and that's been quite successful. I find the knees to be much more difficult. So, of course, we start off by considering with family serial casting, right, putting long casts on week at a time and trying to gradually improve range of motion. This can also be achieved by doing weekly wedges. So sometimes I'll put a cast on one week, I'll do a wedge the next week to gain a little bit and then change the cast the week after. It's laborious, it's challenging, but it's something and it's not surgical. Then you've got your soft tissue lengthenings as we described. When it comes to bony procedures, I men mentioned this for the sake of completeness, but this is a little plate with two screws that's placed on both sides, one screw on each side of the growth plate, and you can actually modulate the growth. You can get the bone to gradually grow crooked and to straighten out a minor deformity, about one degree per month. I don't find many uses for this clinically in, in, in this type of a problem, but it exists. People have written about it, a few papers, two or three, so you might find it. And then we do, we can also do osteotomies where we just shorten the bone and realign it. So in 45 minutes, you can go from a joint contracture to straight, only in selected indications for real functional goals. I have not done any of these surgeries in the population of patients with a myopathy or muscular dystrophy. I just mention it within the general context of neuromuscular diseases. So you can also, I, I always show this because I, it's a case that's always stuck in my mind for many years. So this is Nepal and it's polio. Okay, you get it. Look at the degree of knee flexion contracture here. This is like a this is it's immeasurable. 140 degrees, 108. Who knows what it is? And uh, but this boy was 17 and he'd never walked before. He had very strong upper extremities, trunk, so on and so forth. So he did a simple soft tissue surgery. Now I know this looks like you know. Spanish Inquisition or something, but it's simply traction. The world of orthopedics is based on traction. So we've got some weights pulling here and there because you can't correct a severe deformity at the time of surgery. So if it's half as bad as that, I might get it 50% better with the surgery and then, then the rest with physical therapy or casting or something. Anyhow, suffice it to say, six weeks of the Spanish Inquisition, and there are the straight legs, and there's the boy walking at 17 for the first time, and there he is leading a children's disability uh, advocacy group in that country. Okay, so that's, you know, that's kind of uh, empowerment with a simple surgery and some traction, which our residents still think I'm some kind of a dinosaur or something to even suggest that one might do that, but 
Foot deformities, I don't want to spend a lot of time on. Um, I think it's all, it depends on a person's uh, interest. For example, in the muscular, Duchenne muscular dystrophy group, all the patients get these severe equinovarus deformities. And it's almost never that anyone pays attention to it or asks that it be fixed. And I have to say that half the time, I don't even bring it up other than to mention, yes, I recognize that you have the usual foot thing. And people don't want to talk about it. Every so often, someone will say, I can't wear certain shoes, or it gets very cold in the wintertime, and I'd really like to have a flat foot, in which case we deal with it. But that's not typically a big problem. The hips are a big problem, and, and there are a lot of, so you can have, here's a dislocation of the femoral head, and here's a subluxation. Subluxation is partly out of position. Uh, there's some dysplasia here. There's an abnormality of the socket. There's an abnormality of the anatomy of the femur. So here you have dysplasia with a partially displaced or subluxated hip. Here you have dysplasia with a dislocated hip. It's a spectrum of abnormalities. And the treatment depends on the underlying diagnosis and so on, and the age of the patient. So we'll try how to frame it. So diagnosis in natural history, DDH, hip dysplasia, garden variety, genetic thing is often seen in babies. Sometimes the diagnosis is missed, and then we have to treat it in older patients. You go to other countries, there's no such thing as early diagnosis. So DDH is always walking age patients. So it's a completely different animal to deal with. Age. Hip dysplasia in a baby, independent of its underlying etiology, right? If it's DDH, if there's a neuromuscular dysplasia, and we decide to treat it, which we in, almost always do in a baby, is treated non-operatively with a type of a splinting program. So in hip dysplasia, garden variety, if you diagnose early, you start with a harness or a similar type of device. If you fail, you go to what's called a closed reduction, which involves putting a cast on in the OR. If that fails, then you move on to open strategies for surgical treatment. And there's a graded stepwise approach to managing that in babies, DDH. Or I suspect we always find out afterwards, right? So more commonly for hip dysplasia in neuromuscular, it's often that the diagnosis of a syndrome or neuromuscular disease is made later. We've already been on treating the hip dysplasia because it was diagnosed in the infant, but the actual etiology becomes apparent later on. And the reason why that's important is because hip dysplasia in neuromuscular conditions might have and often does have a different trajectory than that for developmental hip dysplasia. And spastic disease is different than flaccid disease in its natural history and its management. So spastic versus flaccid. In the old days, people learned that putting hips in surgically in polio generally didn't work. Same for spinal muscular atrophy. Because it's flaccid weakness, there wasn't sufficient muscle control and power around the hip to help you, and the hip's often displaced later. So the general treatment recommendations had been that in flaccid disease, it's acceptable to not do these big surgeries and leave the hips out because they rarely became symptomatic. So you say, well, what happens if a hip is out? Will that stop someone from walking? No. I have kids with syndromes who walk into clinic as teenagers with dislocated hips. I had one patient with a syndrome who came in for a scoliosis, and I had to deal with that, and was walking like, here's how this type of walking, right? Because if the hip is displaced from the socket, it creates biomechanical problems, mechanical problems to walking with the function of the muscles around the hip. So you end up with an unsightly gait, which is energy inefficient, but it doesn't stop you. I mean, it's not independently going to stop a patient from walking. She was in her teens. She didn't know her hips were dislocated. Figure that. So we fixed the spine. Now she's about 24, and she's starting to have some issues with her hips, but she's still working, and she's doing very well with her dislocated hips. So it's not a knee-jerk reaction, particularly in an older patient. OK, so let's say you have a completely dislocated hip and it's developmental dislocated, no neuromuscular condition. In the US, if, the child's, if it's bilateral and the kids are older than four to five, we usually do not, because our feeling is that 
the risks of the surgery and the outcomes are perhaps not as good as leaving them alone. See? So for the neuromuscular condition, again, flaccid versus spastic and age of the patient, degree of dysplasia or dislocation or whatever, and we talk about it. There are no written rules. There are technical solutions should you, me, and whomever involved choose to say we're going to go after that hip. We want to give it a shot and put that hip in. Then there are technical solutions, okay? Unilateral versus bilateral functional level is the patient, you know, ambulating? Are they in a stand or so on in the presence of any symptoms? So here's a baby. Both hips are completely dislocated. They're supposed to be there. There's the socket. This is a difficult challenge. Not a baby. This is a toddler, maybe two years old. So you want to know the technical solution for this? The technical solution is that the femur is shortened to avoid problems with the blood supply. The hip is put in by opening the hip joint. Uh, a new socket is made by putting bone graft in there or whatever. And there's your, and it's done typically in a staged manner. So that's a lot. And then the kids are in a cast for six weeks or so. So that's the technical solution in the infant to reducing a dislocated hip. Okay, here's an older patient. This patient had cerebral palsy. It was a progressive displacement of the hip. hip. And once it got to be this point, we could reliably tell the family that this hip will completely dislocate. And in spastic disease, often they become symptomatic and we offer treatment. So the technical solution is the same. We realigned here, put the thing back. Then we created a new socket. And here's six years down the road, the hip is in place. So those are the technical solutions. Pain in the hip seems to be much more common in spastic disease than in flaccid disease. And there are a number of different reasons for that. And there are a number of different solutions for it. But again, in the, in the myopathy population, muscular dystrophy, I've never seen patients with this problem. I'm just for the sake of completeness. So in this case, our usual thing for arthritic hip is to remove the ball of the femoral head and realign the bone here, and that generally works pretty well. So now I hope I'm not too far over time, but I'll quickly go through the spine. The key points to the spine are that it's a three-dimensional problem. And the degree to which any curvature in the spine gets worse depends on the age of the patient, the type of the curve, thoracic versus lower, and the magnitude. Everyone obsesses on this. This is the Cobb angle, right? The Cobb angle simply measures the tilt, the tilt of vertebra in the curve. It's reliable for measuring change, but it doesn't tell you anything about a curve. So what are the issues, the impact? You heard about pulmonary-wise. So in patients who have pre-existing muscle weakness and or challenges with diaphragmatic function, add to that a chest wall deformity and something which further impairs the diaphragm. These are the challenges. There are a number of other functional. So kyphosis, and this kyphosis is normal. This, as you can see, is extra kyphosis. Once it gets to that severity, that can impair pulmonary function. The worst is lordosis. So again, we're looking at the patient from the side. You can see this arching back deformity. This leads to considerable narrowing of the chest diameter, and this is probably the worst spinal deformity with regard to pulmonary function. And so here's another typical neuromuscular curve, a low curve with, associated with obliquity of the pelvis. You can see again, here's the patient's pelvis. So if they were sitting upright, they'd look like this, but to balance out, they sit like that. So what are the key issues that I want to say here in the last couple of minutes? We tend to think about, we don't have any great interventions for a progressive curve other than to surgically arrest that curve so that it won't keep getting worse and impact those issues that I've discussed. But the problem is that if one arrests the progression of a curve in a young patient, we're actually going to do more harm than good for that patient. So, from our perspective, we need to know two things. If we have to stop a curve from progressing, we want to darn, make darn sure that the lungs are developed sufficiently and that the chest is developed sufficiently to allow us to do that and not cause further harm from, for pulmonary function. So Dr. Meyer, I'm sure, can correct this because this is an old slide that I borrowed. But the teaching was that the 
uh, lung development was was close to adult by eight years of age. Now I'm hearing there's more data indicating that this continues to progress into teenage years. And then here's data on development of the trunk height and of the chest wall. And so typically it's felt that a height of the chest of less than 22 centimeters is inadequate. So these are what we're thinking about, okay? So the idea here being that the neuromuscular diseases themselves result in pulmonary dysfunction, as you've heard. We don't want to compound that with a chest wall deformity or a scoliotic deformity. So thoracic, that causes thoracic insufficiency, defined as the inability of thorax to support normal respiration or lung growth. I mean, look at this lung here. There really isn't much lung there on the side of the deformity. So here's the type of patient that you might see in another place in which there's no access to health services. And yes, this does shorten life expectancy. This is just an idiopathic or congenital curve. But look at the severity and the degree of chest wall deformity. This is not compatible with normal lifespan and respiratory function. Here's another example. I mean, do you see much lung there? Look at this is a hundred and something degree upper thoracic curve. So yes, these are big issues. So we need to we need to deal with them. So treatment, observation, small curves, non-progressive curves, young patients, and so on. What we might call positional curve control. Now bracing in neuromuscular curvatures is really a temporary or temporizing measure with the goal of preventing progression. We don't feel we can change the natural history of the underlying condition, but typically we're stuck. The curve's progressing, the child is young, you don't want to do anything definitive and you want to buy time. And so in that regard, a brace can be considered, a soft type of brace. But this has to be, you know, sort of uh, considered within the context of the patient's pulmonary function and so on, right? because it is at least mildly constrictive. And so this is a case-by-case -case basis. One can also do wheelchair modifications. Now again, I'm talking about the greater severity of neuromuscular involvement. And again, this is not specifically talking about RYR1, but rather just the spectrum. And then there becomes surgical treatment. And the key thing about the surgical treatment, I think that I suggested before was Sometimes you're forced into a position where you have to do something and the lung development and chest wall development is insufficient to do a definitive thing. And sometimes it is. So in situations where you don't want to do a definitive treatment, then you have to consider something that's growth sparing. In other words, it's like putting a car jack in your back, like an internal brace. And the thing grows with you and then it buys time and prevents further deformation while allowing for growth. Or later onset or older patient who's met the criteria for lung and chest wall development than a definitive strategy. So here's an example of a spine-based thing you'd heard of something called a growing rod. So it attaches up here, it attaches down there, the rest of the spine isn't exposed, and this thing is literally like a car jack. The more recent ones have been magnetic, so they have some device which can gradually lengthen it while you're in clinic. The traditional method would require a minor surgical intervention every six months to lengthen it to keep up with the growth of the trunk of the child. These are evolving strategies, but it's been, you know, very, very fascinating to see these things develop and they've benefited innumerable patients with, neuro with early onset scoliosis of idiopathic neuromuscular whatever. Vector is something that my partner Bob Campbell had developed and this is another strategy for basically for treating vertebral expandable prosthetic titanium rib, too much to say. But anyway, this is mainly developed for patients with chest wall deformities, but it has now been utilized in selected patients with neuromuscular conditions as a growth sparing strategy. So as you can tell, if you're doing surgery and you're doing growth sparing, you're doing either the vector or the growing rods, and there are advocates for either. We work in the center where both are, both are practiced, but probably leaning a little bit more to the vector. So the vector attaches up to the ribs, and it attaches to the pelvis, and there it is. You don't even do anything to the spine. It's completely away from the spine. 
and kids have gone into adulthood with these things and some patients have even left them in and never had a definitive treatment. They've just left them in and waiting to see. But the jury's out on that, I don't know. And then there's the definitive treatment spinal fusion which involves getting the bones all to grow together. Implants are utilized. I'm sure many of you have heard of this type of surgery. In, so, in some patients, the surgery extends to the pelvis. In our practice, in the majority of neuromuscular patients who don't have severe curves with the pelvis involved, we leave the pelvis out. So um, I may be a little bit over time, so I'll, actually 29.35, so I have 20 seconds. So in orthopedics, it's phenotype, not genotype. Every patient is an individual. Like I say, I want to get to know the patient before I get to know the genotype. Focus on function except the spine because I think the spine is a separate entity that will affect not only quality of life and function but will can potentially affect life expectancy in severe cases. And then there are lots of treatment options. So I'll just say thanks again for having me. I'm six seconds too much. <laughs>